I'm going to report from sayanythingblog.com. Education policy is always a little bit of a political football, and it, and it gets really hard to reform education policy at the state and, and local level because so much of it has become um, entangled, I, I think is the right word, in federal education policy. North Dakota is, in this current legislative session, is considering a resolution, uh, SCR 4012, introduced by Senator Anderson, which would study uh, the involvement of the United States Department of Education in North Dakota education policy. And here to talk with me about that is the superintendent of North Dakota Public Schools, Kirsten Baszler. Uh, superintendent Baszler, tell us first of all about SCR 4012. What does this hope to accomplish? Well, it is a study um, it, that will do exactly that. We're going to take a look to see exactly what kind of federal dollars we get, where we're getting the most of it, and um, what federal, which federal programs can we opt out of. You know, that would be the first question. Which ones can we even opt out of without ensnaring, you know, our Department of Transportation dollars or our Human Service dollars? And then once we identify that, we have to ask ourselves the question, is it in our best interest to do so? Are we spending $2 to get one, or are we getting $2 and only having to spend one? So we'll have to analyze things like that. And, you know, to really ask ourselves the question, what would the cost be to do these things ourselves? Right now, we are receiving about $335 million per biennium of federal money. So um, would it be worth it for us? Could we afford to do these things ourselves? And might we be able to do them less expensively if we chose to do them in North Dakota? You were just elected to your office in the last election, but before that, you've had a you know a lengthy uh, career in in education. What are some of the challenges that you've seen uh, that that stem from this? That that stem from how involved federal policy is in in state and local education policy. It just has gotten more and more prescriptive over the years. I started educa in education over 20 years ago, and over that period of time, I just saw the federal government becoming more and more intrusive in, in how we tested, in, in what we tested, why we tested, and what the results of those tests were. I mean, it was before it was very, it was very used very much primarily to drive our instruction and inform ourselves, you know, to be better better educators, now it seems to have such punitive sanctions on it and reporting factors and um, the, 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 the stick, if you will, versus the carrot. And I think something that has really brought a lot of attention to the, the um, extent to this federal intrusion is when they began being very prescriptive with our school lunch program menus. And that really, once again, brought to light the amount of involvement that our federal government has in the day-to-day -day operations, even down to the local cafeterias and our schools across North Dakota. I think it's hard for a lot of us to imagine how the federal government can effectively set something as, as I, I want to say, minuscule in terms of, of, of the overall policy that the federal government handles as what a kid in a local school district in North Dakota gets on his lunch tray. Uh, that seems to be micromanagement taken to an extreme. Other than other than than say school lunch policies, what are some of the, the you know encumbrances? Maybe perhaps for lack of a better term, are are you looking to to to, to clear off of North Dakota's plate with this study, or or are, are you sort of waiting to see uh, let the study guide the way? I think we're going to let the study guide the way all across. That's what I'm hoping it will reveal to us all across the state. When I was campaigning and traveling and visiting with people, preparing for the election, I was often asked that question. Well, what? Why don't we just? You know, what would happen if we just? You know, told the federal government to keep their money and we were just going to do it our way. And I thought, I wonder what would happen. That's a very good question. Senator Anderson from the Turtle Lake area. He got asked those same questions as he was running from his local constituents. And so we got together and said, you know, let's find out. Let's find out what the answer to that, those questions are and see if it might be something that North Dakota might want to viably consider. Speaking of, of federal policy, uh, No Child Left Behind has been sort of a political hot potato for a while. I think a lot of us understood what the intent of that was, was to bring accountability to education. But... Again, I, I think what we're having, what the problem with No Child Left Behind has been is that it's a sort of one-size-fits-all national policy in, in a country that's not one-size-fits-all, that's in fact very diverse in terms of geography, society, culture, 
you know, just about any anywhere you could point to. We're a very large and very diverse nation. Recently, uh, your office won uh, uh, the right to get a hearing on opting out of, of No Child Left Behind. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, we did. Um, the Department of Public Instruction, uh, state agencies across the nation were, had the opportunity to apply for a, a flexibility waiver from no child from some of the sanctions of No Child Left Behind. We applied for that waiver the la last fall in September. We heard back from the Department of Education in late November, and they asked us to make some revisions that fit um, their ideals of education policy uh, a bit closer. So we made those revisions. We made the ones that we were comfortable with, that you know, kind of non-consequential non revisions. But we stuck very firm to our our proposal of having our students, and the proposal that we stuck close to deals with having our students um, move from proficient, or excuse me, not, not proficient to proficiency, and the number of students that we would move from not proficient to proficient each year. The Department of Ed had requested that we increase that rigor and increase that expert, expectation, raise that bar, if you will. And in North Dakota, we just didn't, uh, it's a different, uh, different difference of philosophies. We don't feel that we have to raise that bar to such a high level in order to make our students and teachers work harder. We like to make the bar attainable, reachable, and then we work with our, our students in our classrooms, teachers, to reach that goal within an, ex uh, an acceptable amount of time. Um, I'm not real optimistic that the Department of Ed will approve that as it's written, but we did, um, ask, request that they move forward with that hearing as it is written and give us an answer, yes or no. How worried are you as you move towards, because obviously with the No Child Left Behind situation and going back to this resolution to study, uh, you know, what, you know, how, how North Dakota can maybe maybe simplify uh, by getting the federal, federal policy out of, of some of these areas of, of state education. But a lot of times that federal money is tied to funding. Um, in that the federal government gives us money and then they say that we have to do this, that, and the other thing. How difficult is that a challenge is that going to be, Make you know pushing for these policy changes while also cognizant of the fact that they're often tied to significant amounts of money? They are tied to a significant amount of money. Our Title I dollars that go to our neediest schools and our, and our poorest children, we receive over 80, um, you know, nearly $83 million for that appropriation alone. And that's money that is directly funneled right out to our school districts to be used in the classrooms across the state of North Dakota. We receive another $67, $68 million of federal money for our special education. And those are for our, um, our academically disadvantaged students and our, and our handicapped students. So that is a, is a big chunk of change, if you will. And to operate without that funding will be a challenge, and, and that's part of what we want to un unveil when we um, do this study is that's a lot of money. Will we be able to operate more efficiently and get better results if we would do it without the strings that are attached, or will our schools be severely disadvantaged without those funds coming into their local schools? Final question. I I wanted to, um, it, it, philosophically, I, and I, I know what you ran for a, a nonpartisan office, but you also got the Republican endorsement. Uh, you campaigned at the convention for that endorsement to run for it. Republicans like to believe in, in this, the idea of federalism, where we have a state with 50, I have a nation with 50 states in it, and, and in each state, uh, the states are, are sovereign to a degree in, in being able to establish what policies work and what policies don't. Uh, a Supreme Court justice at one point said famously that these were called laboratories of democracy. Is that really sort of what you're looking at here is, is to free up North Dakota so that we can be that laboratory for, for, for education policy and figure out what works and what doesn't work for our students here? Exactly, Rob. That's exactly it. And I think North Dakota is positioned so well at this time in our history to do exactly that. We have an incredible work ethic. Of, of educators and parents helping our students learn in North Dakota. We have abundant resources that many, you know, all states do not have at this point. I think with a combination of a vision of good education, the flexibility to implement it in the way that we know works, and the resources to, to do that well, I think will make for a great combination of opportunity for, create, to, for us to create not only the best education system in the United States, but possibly the world. 
I know I said last question, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this as well. Last week, we saw a, a, some tempers flare in the legislature over a, uh, a milk program. Uh, one side of the aisle claiming that uh, we, we, you know, we have an issue with with children uh, needing an extra a carton of milk uh, d during the day, uh, and and upset that the legislature didn't approve of funding for that. Uh, the other side saying that they didn't really hear from schools that that funding was necessary. As as the head of, of the public school system, where do you come down on that issue? You know, I'm always for offering our students any benefit that we can offer them. I think, um, you know, nutrition and milk is obviously a good thing, but I think superintendents, and I mean local superintendents, local principals, teachers, they prioritize. I think that may have been what, um, what, what the issue was, why they weren't there to testify. They prioritize what their most immediate needs or what their largest impact would be, and I'm not sure, I have not heard from superintendents that that is a major priority in the in the um, in in the session this term. As I said, I always believe that it's it's important for us to t take care of our children, and I think any investment in them is a worthwhile investment. But I do think that there was also some misinformation out there. Um, most of our students, especially our you know our free and reduced students, have an opportunity um, to participate in the school breakfast program, and they receive a, a carton of milk at you know approximately between 7:30 and 8:30, and then they participate in the school lunch program as well, and the, which gives them a carton of milk at about 11:30 between 11:30 and 12. So this bill would have provided yet another carton of milk somewhere between you know about 90 minutes apart from the first one and 90 minutes away from the second one. So I really didn't um, I don't want people to believe that we're not giving our children milk when they're in school. They are receiving Two, two cartons of milk. And, you know, they're also, I, I should tell you that um, our, our school lunch program are available in almost all of our K through um, three classrooms and about eight, the school breakfast program is in about 85% of our schools, um, of our North Dakota schools. And 37% of our school lunches and 61% of our school breakfasts are served to our students that are eligible for free or reduced. So um, I think there was a lot of miscommunication and, and an embroiled battle over a, a lot of missing information there. Right. I should also also mention, not very many people are aware of this, and if school districts aren't participating in it, we also provide a fresh fruit and vegetable snack grant program through the Department of Public Instruction. And we have a high number of our students eligible for those um, for those snacks of fresh fruits and vegetables. So that's also an alternative to just another milk break. So good to know, Kirsten. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate your time.